me again share my screen with you. Well, welcome. This is the second lecture of the uh, of our summer school on introspection and uh, consciousness. And today's lecture is called Focus on Schumacher. And let me begin by recapping what we did last time. Last time I set out in very general terms what introspection is and noted some theories of introspection that can be found in in contemporary philosophy, in the contemporary scene. So you'll remember that introspection, we said, is that distinctive way that we come to know about the conscious states that we're in. Distinctive means a way that's neither perceptual nor inferential, at least as perception and inference are normally understood. And a theory of introspection is just a theory is just information really about what that way might be. And I mentioned very, very quickly a bunch of different possible theories, including perceptual theories, inferential theories, constitutivist theories, um, acquaintance theories, and rationalist theories. Uh, today, sorry, today I want to is today is our first sort of focus on lecture. You'll remember that the second lecture uh, of each pair of four will be a kind of focus on a particular philosopher. And today I want to look at Sidney Shoemaker's criticisms of inner sense theories. These criticisms are really kind of pivotal uh, in the literature on introspection. And many of the, the problems uh, and issues that we're concerned with are sort of in a way premised on what Shoemaker has to say about in a sense theories. So it's extremely important when understanding these sorts of issues to uh, to to have a, a good sense of what Shoemaker is talking about. Now I'm going to be focusing particularly on the first two of his so-called Royce lectures, which are published were published in Philosophy and Phenomenological Research in 1994, and then were reprinted in his well-known collection, The First Person Perspective and Other Essays. And I say much of the literature on introspection and consciousness is sort of premised on Shoemaker's positions here. So it's, it's good to know. Now, as I say, uh, as I said last time, our focus on lectures are going to be a bit shorter because we want to have some Zoom discussions about this and about anything else for that matter afterwards. So I think this one will take uh, about half an hour or so probably something somewhere in that uh, vicinity. So let me uh, first begin with a photo just to show you there is uh, Sidney Schumacher and his dog and his wife and uh, those two little boys are my children. This is from about 2010 when Sidney was kind enough to invite me to his uh, his house uh, in uh, uh, just uh, north of uh, Cornell in um, just north of Ithaca in uh, in uh, upstate New York. So that's who we are talking about. Now I want to begin, in a way this rehearses some of the points that we made last time, uh, I want to begin um, by pointing out that it's not a, a trivial matter to hold an inner sense theory of introspection or a perceptual theory. We can use the word perceptual model, perceptual theory, observation model sometimes, or inner sense theory is the traditional word. We'll use all those words interchangeably. Um, it's not a, a trivial matter to have a, an inner sense theory of introspection. And um, I mean, any inner sense theory is going to understand introspection in some way or other on the model of perception, not on the model of testimony, not on the model of intuition, not on the model of inference, but on the model of perception. That's what an inner sense theory does. And the reason that isn't a trivial thing to do is because the word introspection, as you'll remember from last time, is being used here in a very neutral way, or in a way that I said last time is a sort of 
counter-etymological way. So we're just ignoring the, uh, the sort of linguistic overtones of the word introspection. It's just that introspection is being used to mark a particular way that we come to know certain things. But uh, the word itself doesn't give us any guide as to what the nature of that way is. So that if you endorsed a kind of perceptual model, that would be a substantive rather than a trivial issue in the sense that it doesn't follow immediately just from the way that we use the word, even though, of course, it's true that the word has these perceptual overtones in it. And just as there are ways in which one can use the word introspection without having perceptual overtones, it's also the case, um, as we sort of in effect noted, is that we can even use the word perception without what you might call perceptual overtones. We can use the word perception can appear in many, many different forms, not all of which involve something, something like vision or touch, uh, something like, in other words, sense perception, perception via the senses. In this particular context, we'll be thinking of perception as sense perception. And so then the issue is whether the thing that we call introspection, that way that special way that we come to know these certain facts um, is similar to sense perception in an important sense. And that's, that's the assertion of an inner sense theory, that the thing that we call introspection, call without prejudice introspection, uh, is, um, is perceptual in the sense of being similar to sense perception. Um, now, the moment we start to think about this issue, uh, we need to, of course, bear in mind that it, it, it's not so easy to say that introspection, it's not so easy to assess the issue as, as whether, uh, this, to assess the issue uh, of whether um, introspection is or is not like perception. And the reason is, that, one reason for that is that there are many, many different things that people have meant by perception both in the contemporary literature and in the history of philosophy. And this is a point that Schumacher in, his, in these papers that we're looking at is extremely sensitive to, I think, in a, in a very good way. So he, he, um, he sort of points out that there are different theories, uh, begins by pointing out that there are different theories of perception and the claim that introspection is like perception usually depends on one or other of those theories. So sometimes people say, you know, people hold a representational theory of perception, for example, uh, in which uh, when you perceive a thing, when I see the wallet on the desk, for example, I represent something in, in a certain kind of way, or perhaps it's just that it seems to me that there is a wallet. And so the question of if, if you thought that introspection was like perception, on the representational theory of perception, then you'd uh, then you uh, would uh, ag be agreeing that um, there are introspective representations, just as there are perceptual representations, and whether there are or there aren't, that's a, a substantive issue, and we can't just um, um, you know necessarily assume that there are, and we can't even assume that a, a perceptual a person who advances a perceptual model. Uh, will say that there are. Um, actually, sometimes people say in philosophy that they are disjunctivists about introspection and representationalists about perception. And here what they're alluding to is this famous dispute between representationalists in the philosophy of perception and disjunctivists. Disjunctivists in the philosophy of perception typically think of perception as a relation between in this, if, when I when I look at my wallet, for example, there's some sort of relation between me and my wallet on the interest, on the disjunctivist view, um, and it, that relation does not involve, in a typical development of that view, doesn't uh, involve a certain kind of representation of the wallet, um, and so people who who are disjunctivists about introspection think of introspection as analogous to perception, as the disjunctivist understands perception, but not as the representationalist understands uh, perception. Um, so we need to be clear what notion of perception we have in mind. Shoemaker makes, I think, a very good point about this when he starts, 
when he discusses Locke. The reason he discusses Locke is that um, Armstrong, who he's who he has in mind as as one of the main proponents of the inner sense view, as he says, he's the main champion of the inner sense view. Often compares his position to Locke's and says that Locke was a proponent of an inner sense view, and in that sense, sort of claims a kind of historical lineage back to Locke. And Shoemaker points out that. Locke had a, a theory of perception, which from our point of view seems somewhat strange. He, if in, 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 for Locke, from Locke's point of view, in a case in which I'm, for example, perceiving my wallet on the desk, what in fact happens is that I, I perceive certain ideas in the mind, which are understood as mental objects of a certain kind, that have certain properties, and that my wallet uh, perhaps is a physical object that has certain properties and resembles that idea in the mind. But the thing that I, in the, in the first instance, perceive are these ideas. And so Locke asks, and I've put this here on the, uh, on the slide, was, uh, Schumacher says, was Locke, in speaking of perception of ideas, embracing the perceptual model? Was he thinking of our epistemic access to mental entities as like our epistemic access to the standard objects of sense perception? By the standard objects of sense perception, he has in, uh, Shoemaker has in mind things like wallets and so forth, and he points out that he that it was presumably true in Locke's time, as in ours, that when we ordinarily talk about what we see, we mean things like wallets and you know bottles and lamps and things like that, and um, and Shoemaker says that well maybe it's true that Locke was advancing the inner sense theory, but he clearly didn't think of introspection. Um, on the model of perception as he, Locke, understood perception. That isn't how he thought of introspection at all. Uh, perhaps, as Schumacher says, he understood uh, introspection on the model of perception as we naively take it to be, not as he, Locke, took it to be in his philosophy. So um, we're not going to resolve this, this matter now. It's a sort of interesting question about Locke. Um, about how he was understanding perception and how he was understanding introspection. Actually, Locke referred to it not so much as introspection as reflection, mostly. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, it, it, the moral really is that um, in speaking of a perceptual model, you need to have you need to be clear what notion of perception you have in mind, uh, because there's going to be as many different versions of a perceptual model of introspection as there are versions. Of, uh, of perception, and since there are many of them, the whole issue is going to get very complicated. So let me then summarize what Shoemaker's procedure is in these papers. Um, and really the procedure is, is supposed to be a way of maneuvering around the point that I just was elaborating, namely that maneuvering around the point that uh, there are different notions of perception and therefore the question of whether introspection is like perception is a, is a very complicated one. Now what Schumacher does is that he, um, well he associates sense perception with several very general features or properties of sense perception. Uh, Schumacher doesn't put the point this way, but a lot of philosophers, I think, would say that what he's doing here is treating um, sense perception as what is sometimes called a cluster concept, a concept that involves a range of different features or properties. And um, he doesn't suppose that every, you know, every theorist or or everybody who talks about perception thinks that it uh, satisfies all of these features. On the contrary, what, what Shoemaker does, uh, and this is the second part of his procedure, is, th is what he does is he, um, he says there are different stereotypes of perception, different, if you like, conceptions of perception, ways of thinking about perception, which, and what these uh, different stereotypes do is that they emphasize some of these features at the expense of the others. So we can think, if you like, we've got this series of features uh, and different 
approaches to perception, different stereotypes, will treat some of these features as having more weight in whether a thing counts as perception as something else. Um, and then um, what Schumacher does, and this is the third part of his procedure, is to assess different versions of the inner sense theory um, depending on how, what feature or what stereotype of perception they have in mind. So which, which particular theory of perception, um, uh, which, which theory of perception is at issue in, in particular, which of these different features or properties are associated with perception are the really crucial ones. Um, um, and that, so so that, that's supposed to maneuver around this problem that there are many different theories of perception. The general idea is that we can think of sense perception as a thing that satisfies a whole bunch of different properties. And then the real question about whether you endorse a, a perceptual model of introspection is a matter of whether you um, think that introspection has one or other of these properties. So let me um, uh, give you a list then of the properties that he talks about. And there are eight of these properties uh, which he discusses uh, relatively early on. Uh, yes, in section two he begins, I am now going to list and briefly characterize some features of certain ordinary cases of sense perception. So what are the features that he has in mind? Well, he doesn't name them exactly in this way, but I think this is a faithful characterization of what he's talking about. First, we have the notion that sense perception involves an organ. Uh, sense perception often involves the operation of a particular part of the body, e.g. the eye or the ears. So in vision, for example, there's a certain part of the body, namely an eye, which is somehow associated with, uh, with perception or the ears. Um, clearly, there are going to be examples of sense perception which don't involve an organ in an obvious sense, maybe the maybe a proprioceptive sense, to use a, a notion that, that, that Armstrong is, was keen on em emphasizing in this particular part, uh, on this particular part, namely proprioception tells you about, say, the, the, the position and nature of your body, um, and that doesn't involve an organ in any obvious sense. But certainly uh, some features, a feature that's associated with perception, is, an, is, is having some sort of organ, and perhaps the organ also is, in a certain sense, under your control, like your, you can turn your eyes, you can shut your eyes, and so forth. The second feature is, we can call it experience, and the idea is that sense perception typically involves uh, a certain sort of sensory or experiential character, maybe sometimes a sensation it's thought of, or an experience or something. The idea is that when you perceive something, so suppose you perceive a particular color, um, that is in a certain sense like feeling something insofar as it has a particular sensory or experiential character. Um, maybe it involves other things too. Sense perception may involve other things too, but it certainly involves that. And that's the, that's the second feature that, um, that Schumacher is interested in. The third one is object, what he calls object awareness. And here the notion, the idea is that in sense perception, we come to know various facts. Actually, that notion of perception was something that I was implicitly relying on last time when I said that introspection is distinct from perception. The idea is that perception too is a source of knowledge. We come to know various facts, or perhaps we can say we become aware of various facts. But the, po the point that's at issue here in this third feature is that when we come to know various facts in sense perception, we do so by being aware of an object. So the idea is that I can come to know a certain fact, for example, that my wallet uh, is on the desk, by being aware in perception of my wallet. So the, the distinction here is between what you might think of as fact awareness, coming to know that something is true, that there is a wallet on the desk, versus being aware of a wallet, a thing. And the idea is that in sense perception, uh, we come to know various facts by being aware of certain objects. The fourth feature, 
we can call identification information. And in a way, this, this feature builds on the previous one. It says that in sense perception, we typically come to know facts. We are about, we do, we, it's not just that we come to know certain facts and we do so by being aware of certain objects. But what's also true is that we, can, we know facts about the identity and difference of the objects that we perceive. So that when, um, for example, I come to know that my wallet is on the desk by perception, I can differentiate my wallet, my wallet from other objects that are also on the desk. I also can, so I can, I can identify my wallet and differentiate it between, and differentiate between it and other things. Likewise, I can re-identify the wallet over time. If I turn my head and look back, I can see the wallet and I can identify it as the same wallet as a result of sense perception. So sense perception affords these certain sorts of information. That's feature four. Um, the fifth feature we might call intrinsic properties. This is a sort of slightly complicated metaphysical aspect of the objects that we become aware of in sense perception. So what, what Schumacher says is that we typically come to know that objects stand in, for example, certain relations by being aware of the non-relational or intrinsic properties that they have. And some, sometimes people are very clear to distinguish relational properties or no, sorry, non-relational properties and extrinsic properties. Here, I th just to give you the flavor of this particular feature, I don't think that matters all that much. The idea is that when you come to know, for example, that the wallet is on the desk by perception, you do so by perceiving the wallet, but you also do so by perceiving the intrinsic features of the wallet, the non-relational features. For example, its shape or its color. Shape is, for example, thought of as an intrinsic feature of the wallet. It's something that the wallet has in and of itself, not because of its relation to other things. Likewise, the color of the wallet is something that the wallet has in and of itself, not, uh, not uh, as it's related to other things. Um, it's not to be doubted that you can come to know relational facts uh, in sense perception. So this feature of perception isn't denying that you can come to know relational facts. It's that you come to know relational facts by knowing uh, facts about the intrinsic features uh, or by, at least by being aware of the intrinsic features of the properties that you have of the objects that you that you perceive so that if I if I perceive the wallet I know it has a certain shape and a color um, and uh, I can also perceive its relation uh, to other objects but then what I'm doing is perceiving its thing this thing with its shape and its color in relation to these other objects the next feature, feature six, is attention. Um, this is actually a very important uh, uh, feature um, uh, for, uh, for introspection, I think. Uh, what Schumacher says is that in sense perception, we're not simply aware of objects, but we're aware of them in such a way that uh, they are the potential objects of attention. So if I see my wallet on the desk, for example, then the, the wallet is a potential object of attention in the sense that I can attend to it uh, uh, should I want to. Attend to it, in this case, means something like uh, focus on it, for example, take an interest in it, perhaps. Um, uh, and seeing the object or being aware of the object makes it a potential object of attention. The seventh feature, causation, says that um, in sense perception, we are, we're caused to know or believe things, for example, that there is a wallet on the desk, because of facts about the object perceived. So in the case in which I perceive a wallet and come to know or believe that there's a wallet on the desk, I come to know and believe that there's a wallet on the desk in part because of the causal influence of that wallet on, on me. It causes me to go into a, um, a particular state, perhaps a state of believing that there's a wallet on the desk or knowing, or, or perhaps even having the experiences that are mentioned in the second of the features that we 
we're talking about. And finally is the idea that the, of what Schumacher calls independence, it's that objects and states of affairs that we come to know about in perception um, exist independently of their perceivers and their perceptual capacities. So if I were, suppose I was struck blind, for example, or just plucked out of existence completely, um, my wallet would remain there with all of its observable properties, with its color and its shape and so forth. Those seem to be independent uh, from me and my perceptual capacities. And a perception seems to be a, a system in which when I come to be aware of an object and aware of its intrinsic properties, those objects and the intrinsic properties of that thing are independent somehow of my existence and of, of my own uh, perception. So these are the eight features that Schumacher uh, is mentions. He doesn't claim that they're sort of exhaustive of the nature of perception. He doesn't claim uh, that there, there might be further features. In fact, I'll mention a further feature later on. Um, he doesn't claim that, that um, there aren't many things to say about all of these features. There are. The general idea, though, is to, to remind us of what sorts of features of perception that we have in mind when we're talking about introspection model, introspective models of perception um, <clears throat> to, try to, to try to give some shape to the question of whether introspection is like perception or not. Um, okay, so what then does Schumacher do with these eight notions? Well, he, what he does is he focuses on two versions of the inner sense view. Obviously, you could vote f focus on umpteen versions of the inner sense view, but he focuses on two as being particularly prominent, and I think he's right about that. And the two versions are, as he calls them, the object perception model and the broad perception model. And the object perception model says that introspection is like perception in that it instantiates features three through six, or at least those are the crucial features that, that matter for the object perception model. So let's just review what those are. Three, so three through six is three is object awareness. So the idea is that introspection is like perception insofar as when you come to know certain facts, you do so by being aware of objects. Uh, uh, the next one for identification information is that in sense perception, we typically come to know facts about the identity and difference of the objects perceived. That's true also uh, on introspection according to the object perception model. Uh, intrinsic properties is, uh, applies in this case. So the idea is that in, in introspection, like in sense perception, we know that certain, we know certain relational facts or come to know certain relational facts by by perceiving the intrinsic features or the non-relational features of these objects. And six, the attention one is that we come to know when we're aware of these objects, these objects are potential objects of attention for us. We can turn our attention to these objects just as when I see the wallet, I can turn my attention to the wallet. Likewise, in introspection, according to this view, uh, <coughs> you can do that. Um, you, can, you can turn uh, your attention to mental items. Um, so that's the object perception model. The broad perception model is much, much weaker. It says really that introspection is like perception in that it instantiates features seven and eight. So seven and eight is a causation and um, independence. Causation says in sense perception, we're caused to know or believe things because of the object perceived. So the idea is that in introspection, there's the, the first, the conscious state, the first order state, and then there's the belief that you're in it. And, and, the, and the conscious state causes the belief that you're in it. Um, and likewise, the uh, broad perception model says that the, uh, the objects of introspection are distinct from the beliefs that you form, are independent from the beliefs that you form, just as in introspection, the wallet is distinct from um, from the perceptual belief that you might form or even the perception that you have. Um, uh, 
Now notice that um, this in a sense sets aside uh, features one and two entirely. So features one and two were the, the notion of an organ and the notion of an experience. He, Shoemaker doesn't think that it's of, of great interest to discuss whether introspection involves an organ. Though there was a, a scientific paper recently I noticed that in fact said that perhaps there was something organ-like but in a way it doesn't matter uh, for Shoemaker's purposes to worry about that point. Um, and likewise, and perhaps this is kind of more interesting from a philosophy of mind point of view, uh, he doesn't think that uh, that in introspection there's a specific kind of experience that is involved. Uh, that isn't part of a part of a um, of an of an of a perceptual model of introspection, uh, at least not the not the versions that he's discussing. Um, so. Sometimes people say, well, there's a kind of obvious objection to a perceptual model, and that is that in introspection, there's no such thing as an inner experience of our own mental lives. And that may be true, but uh, Schumacher thinks that isn't a problem as far as assessing the perceptual model goes. Okay, so then why does he reject these uh, two features? We're going a little bit over, but I think it'll be good to go through these things. Why does, he, how, why does he reject the um, object perceptual model? Well, um, I think he does this mainly by example. And this is what happens in the first lecture, and then in the second lecture he mainly rejects the broad perception model. Well, let's take a case in which I, I know that I believe something. So suppose, let's take his example that I mentioned last time, I believe that Sacramento is the capital of California. Suppose I know that I believe this. So I know that I believe this. Perhaps we can say I know that I believe it by introspection. Well, on the broad perception model, what has to happen in this case is that there must be some mental item or object that instantiates the features um, are uh, uh, three, four, five, and six, three to six. That is, there must be a mental item that I'm aware of, an object that I'm aware of. I can attend to it if I want. Uh, it it has available various intrinsic properties, and I can identify and re-identify that object. That's what the broad perceptual model says. It models my coming to know that I believe that Sacramento is the capital of California in precisely the way that we would model my coming to know that I believe that, that, that there is a wallet on the desk by being aware of a wallet with and being able to attend to the wallet and so forth. But Shoemaker's point is that in, in the case in which I know that I believe that Sacramento is the capital of California, there's, there's no such object. It just doesn't seem to behave that way. I mean, so let's ask ourselves what this object could possibly be. Well, there are certain candidate options, but none of them seem to fit. None of them seem to, you know, um, do the job, basically. So sometimes when we talk about, uh, sometimes people talk about, you know, the belief that Sacramento is the capital of California. That can mean several things, actually, but... One thing it can often mean is the proposition that you believe. So, so you know, I believe that Sacramento is the capital of California. You believe it. That means we both believe the same proposition. There's a thing that we believe. Um, and there is this thing. That is an object in a certain sense, perhaps. Uh, but that can't be the thing that's at issue for the perceptual model of introspection because that isn't a mental object at all, and it's also not perceptually available. Uh, it's normally thought of as a sort of abstract object. So it can't be the thing that we sometimes refer to as the belief that Sacramento is the capital of California, in other words, the proposition, because that isn't, that isn't even a mental object, so there isn't, it can't be the thing that has, the, 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 that's the potential object of attention that I'm aware of, etc. What about, you might think, well, what about the state of affairs that 
if it obtained, would make my belief true. In other words, the state of affairs that Sacramento is the capital of California. There is a state of affairs like that. Um, um, and if it obtained, which it does, then my belief is true. But that can't be the thing either, because that isn't a mental thing. Um, that's something to do with California. It's got nothing to do with me and my beliefs. Another object that you might look to might be something like a sentence in the language of thought. On some views of belief, when you believe that something like Sacramento is the capital of California, what has to happen is that there must be a, a sentence, an inner sentence, or a something, something, an inner mental representation that represents Sacramento and represents it as being the capital of California. And that must be in place in order that you believe that Sacramento is the capital of California. But the thing is that on most views about this, I'm not aware of that sentence at all. There may be, there may have to be such a sentence uh, in order that I have the belief that may be true. It may be just empirically impossible, for example, to have the belief uh, if you don't have that sentence or something like that sentence. But that sentence isn't anything that I'm aware of. It's, this, it, it's something that, uh, no, at least not in introspection, if I came to be aware that I have a sentence like that, then I would do that via inference. That's a sort of piece of empirical cognitive science. It's not, a, it's not something that I could be aware of by introspection. So that doesn't work either. Sometimes, of course, there are sentences that are more available. Perhaps there's a sentence in natural language, say in English, uh, the sentence, the English sentence, Sacramento is the capital of California, uh, or perhaps an, uh, a sentence in what people call inner speech, sort of imagined speech, let's say, or represented silent speech. Um, but the thing is that while it is true that um, sometimes when you believe that Sacramento is the capital of California, there is a sentence available. You may have uttered the sentence out loud, or you might have said it to yourself, you know, sotto voce, or perhaps uh, uh, in, in a speech. The thing is that there doesn't seem, it, 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 it's not as if that's a universal fact. I mean, one can certainly have a belief and there isn't any spe inner speech or, nat or a sentence of natural language in the vicinity. And it seems clear enough that one could still come to know that one believes something. Um, and what about finally the state of affairs that consists not of Sacramento being the capital of California, but of my believing something, namely my believing that Sacramento is the capital. Maybe that's the thing that I'm aware of. That, in a way, is the best, I think, best option uh, for this proposal. Um, maybe that's a, some sort of object or something that I can be aware of and perhaps attend to um, and distinguish from other things. So maybe that's the best candidate. But the problem with this is that when you think about it, when you say things, something like, I am aware of my believing that Sacramento is the capital of California, I am aware of my believing that Sacramento is the capital of California, that um, that sounds like a, a kind of just a verbose way of saying that you know that you believe that Sacramento is the capital of California. And so that that's true. It may be that you do know that, uh, but that's what you're trying to explain. So it can't be the thing that it can't be that there is this state of affairs and you're aware of it in this way, which is the thing that the object perception model um, <coughs> wants to focus on. Uh, another example that one might have is um, uh, coming to believe not that you um, that you um, that some that you hold some belief. But suppose that you believe that you have a pain in the leg, or suppose that you know uh, that you have a pain in the leg. How did you know that? That's not knowing that you have a belief. It's knowing that you have a pain, that you have a certain feeling. How did you know that? Well, again, on the object perception model, there must be some mental item that you're aware of that you can attend to that instantiates various intrinsic properties which are available to you to attend to as well and that you can identify and re-identify. But once again, the point seems to be that there, there just isn't such an object. Um, one might be able to attend to the fact that you have a pain in the leg, let's say, or the state of affairs that consists of your having a pain in the leg, but that doesn't seem to be an object of the relevant kind. 
And again, the reason is that being aware of your, your having a pain in the leg uh, seems to be just a matter of knowing that you have a pain in the leg. So that doesn't seem to be the thing that's at issue. Um, now, you might say in this particular case that there's this is a sort of famous objection. Um, Schumacher says, in fact, that, that cases like, like this of bodily sensations are perhaps the best case for the object perception model. And the reason is that um, you might say, of course, there's, uh, of course there's such an object. Um, it's that pain in your leg. When you have a pain in the leg, suppose you have a pain you know, in a specific part of your leg, like in your knee, for example, then there's a sense in which you can attend to that pain. And when you attend to it, you can come to know that you have a pain in the leg. So there is this object, namely this, this thing, which at least in English we call a pain, and we think of it as being in the leg or in the knee or something. And that seems to be an object uh, which you can attend to. But um, uh, I think this line of thought isn't such a good defense of the object perception model for a number of reasons. First of all, it seems uh, very peculiar to certain languages that we can speak about pains in the leg in this way, thinking that we have pains as things in the leg that we can attend to. It's true, certainly, that in English we do that, uh, but it's not true that we can do that in all languages. Uh, there's a recent paper by Colin Klein and Michelle uh, Liu that point this out very well, that, for example, in Mandarin, which is in there, uh, in Chinese, in other words, um, uh, they point out that in, you, don't, you don't speak about pains in this way. So in a certain sense, we need to be careful that we're not importing um, features of the way we talk about language here into the object perceptual model. But the other thing is that we're interested in introspection, not so much in knowing that I have a pain in the leg construed as an object, but that I'm interested in knowing that I have a pain in the leg. So I'm not interested so much in the pain, but in the fact that I have that pain, in the fact that I have a certain pain. And that fact is not in my leg, certainly. So it's a little bit hard to see that, uh, that even if there were this thing, which is an object, uh, that it would have something to do with the introspection case. Thirdly, while it's true that you can think of pains in a certain way as something in the leg, um, there's a sense in which when you think of them in that way, they're not really mental. They're thought of as things that are mental, but they don't seem to be mental in an obvious way because they're located in the leg. Uh, and mental things don't, don't seem to be located in quite that way. Um, and then finally, which I think is in, in the end probably the most um, prominent or kind of most persuasive response to this, and, and that is that even if pains are, we do think of pains as things in the leg that we can feel, and even if we suppose that they're mental. This example won't generalize to other cases. I mean, um, when you know that there's a wallet, so, so sorry, when you know that you're seeing a wallet, for example, there still doesn't seem to be a mental item. You can attend to the wallet, of course, but that's not a mental item at all. So, uh, so it's not clear that this view would generalize. Um, there's a point here about the object perception model and attention. I might pass over this point. Uh, we can, you can ask me about it in discussion if you like. It has to do with this issue about whether uh, you can attend to something prior, attend to something prior to coming to know uh, that you're in it. That you, you can attend in introspection. You can um, attend to certain mental events prior to coming to know that you're in the mental states, prior to coming to know that you're in them or not. Uh, but it's a somewhat um, uh, difficult issue. So I will, I'll pass over that and move to the broad perception model. Uh, so we've looked at um, what Shoemaker says about the... Um, the inner, the, 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 the object perception model, what does he say against the broad perception model? Well, what is the broad perception model? Well, the broad perception model says that there's a sort of empirical law-like connection between being in the conscious state, <clears throat> for example, believing that 
Sacramento is the capital of California or feeling a pain in the leg and believing that you're in that state. And for Schumacher, uh, that is a, uh, a version of an inner sense view because it satisfies these two conditions. Causation, which as we saw before, was that in sense perception, we're caused to know or believe things because, in the sense of causally because, the object perceived. And also independence, that the objects and states of affairs that we come to know about in perception exist independently of perceivers and their perceptual capacities. So the idea is, in the broad perceptual model, is that I come to believe that I'm in a certain mental state. The mental state causes me to believe that I'm in it, and my belief that I'm in it is independent from the mental state itself. And that's, what's, that's the kind of picture of the broad perceptual model. Now, um, Alex Berner, in the, the book that I, I asked you to look at of his, his recent book called Transparency and Self-Knowledge, has an extensive discussion of uh, inner sense and the objections to inner sense. And one of the things he does in that discussion, I think, is point out uh, correctly that it's a bit, it's not quite accurate to say that a, that a theory which satisfies seven and eight, satisfies causation and independence, um, is um, that a theory like that is properly called, a, that the, the mere fact that you satisfy those conditions uh, means that you should be an inner sense theory. It's not sufficient to count as an inner sense theory. And the way he does this is by, by, by noting that an inferential theory could just as well accept seven and eight. So if we go back to seven and eight, Suppose I, I come to know that, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a cat, for example, on the basis of inference from my behaviour. I, I see myself behave in a mirror in certain ways. Um, I think, well, no one would behave that way unless uh, they're seeing a cat. Therefore, I'm seeing a cat. Um, suppose I go through that sort of process. Well, then, then my seeing a cat causes, perhaps my belief that I'm seeing a cat, it does so by causing my behavior, which then cause, and then I see my behavior and infer to the fact that I'm seeing a cat. So the causation element is in place. And likewise, the independence element is in place. Uh, the belief that you're seeing a cat is clearly independent of uh, the fact that you're seeing a cat, but no one would claim that this is a case of uh, a perceptual model, an inner sense model. So the mere fact that you satisfy causation and independence doesn't seem to be strong enough um, to um, uh, doesn't seem to be strong enough to show it doesn't seem to be sufficient to show that you hold an inner sense view. So you need to add something. Byrne himself suggests that what you what you need to add is that the the broad perceptual model would be what Byrne calls extravagant rather than economical. Uh, in his sense, that should say, sorry, in his sense. Um, and it's a little hard to keep track of this, this distinction that Byrne has. When you look at his book, he, d he draws this distinction between extravagant and economical theories, where intuitively <clears throat> economical theories are theories that sort of use materials that are around sort of more or less anyway to deal with introspection, materials which already are doing some sort of cognitive or epistemic job. And an extravagant theory is a theory that goes beyond that in a certain way. Um, it's a bit hard for me to see that the broad perceptual model uh, is extravagant, however. I mean, if you think of Armstrong's view, Armstrong explicitly thought of introspection as rather like proprioception, uh, insofar as it wasn't, it didn't have an organ and it didn't have a particular kind of experience associated with it. Those are the first two features that Schumacher says. Um, and in that sense, it doesn't seem particularly extravagant to think that it um, uh, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to see that Armstrong's position is particularly extravagant. In fact, in a certain sense, Armstrong's position and Byrne's position look about as look about the same when it comes to the materials that they use. And so it's a bit hard to say that Armstrong's position is extravagant. So it doesn't look as if if we if we went in Byrne's way here, we wouldn't even um, we wouldn't even um, uh, have a proper account of what a broad perception model is. So 
so what are we going to do? Byrne points out correctly that uh, merely satisfying 7 and 8 isn't sufficient for holding a broad perceptual model. Um, but I think he hasn't quite solved this problem. I think there's a slightly better way to solve this problem, which is more true to the broad perceptual model um, and is, is really relies on something that was implicit, I think, in Shoemaker's discussion all along. And that is that there's a further feature of perception. Remember I said that Shoemaker doesn't think that those eight features are exhaustive. There's a further feature of perception, which is that perception is somehow independent from rationality. So that a, a, a blind person, for example, can be as rational as anybody else, even though they lack the capacity to see. Now, whether or not this is a proper feature of, of perception is an interesting question. It's a bit related to the issue about whether there's a clear perception cognition boundary, for example, which is a big topic in philosophy of cognitive science. But at any rate, it's certainly the case that on many, what Schumacher would think of as stereotypes of uh, perception, um, there is a relatively clear distinction. And moreover, this distinction is an issue in um, Schumacher's um, discussion of uh, the broad perception model. So I think it's that that really makes the broad perception model a perception model. It satisfies conditions seven and eight. And in addition, it conceives of perception as something that you can extract from, a, from an agent uh, without, at least in principle, uh, without um, without without um, damaging or changing their rationality. Of course, you can't do that empirically, but one can do it uh, in principle. So, what then is the argument that Schumacher gives against um, the broad perception model? Well, his objection to the broad perception model is this self blindness argument, which is his sort of most notorious argument and that's the one that he pursues in the second of the two papers that I wanted you to look at and this argument is really very dark and difficult in Shoemaker's own discussion what you find is in his discussion what he typically does is he says well when you take away the capacity of introspective belief or the capacity to believe that you're in the state introspectively from the state itself when you subst subtract that functional role from the state, state itself, you take away, as he says, a lot else. Um, so if you, if you subtract the introspective belief from various mental states, then in a certain sense, they can't play their normal functional role. That is really the way that he tries to develop this point. Um, it's not clear to me that that is very plausible, actually, because it's not clear to me that um, having an introspective belief about a state is part of the normal functional role of the state. Another example of how difficult this this argument is, I think, emerges if you look at Burns discussion of um, the self blindness argument. Um, Byrne is, you know, really, in many ways, kind of masterful on this literature. But in this particular topic, you feel it just doesn't seem to be quite as crisp. And that's partly because he's talking about a um, extremely difficult version of the of the self blindness argument in which the idea is that if it's rational to interpret a third party as having certain mental states in certain contexts, then it would be rational for them to interpret rational for you to interpret them as also believing that they're in those states. And Byrne, I think, quite rightly uh, objects that this involves certain kind of behaviorist premises, um, which he thinks. Uh, Schumacher shouldn't be uh, entitled to. Anyway, have a look at those discussions and and uh, see what you think. My general impression is that both Schumacher's discussion and, to to a lesser extent, Burns' discussion are quite quite hard to follow. But I think there's a much simpler rendering uh, of the self blindness argument. Uh, so I thought I would just give you this rendering and then uh, leave it for you to think about. So the, the argument goes in outline like this. Um, this, is, I don't think, is news to, to say Byrne or to, or to Schumacher, but something like this. Premise one, if the broad perceptual model is true, self-blindness is possible. Premise two, but self-blindness is not possible, therefore the broad perceptual model is not true. What is it to say that self-blindness is possible? Well, what it means to say, I think, is that there could be a creature who is in intense 
is in intense pain, let's say, um, is perfectly rational, is concerned with whether they're in pain, that is, it, they're not distracted by something else, um, they're capable of believing that they're in intense pain, so they're, they're psychologically equipped in the relevant way, they have the concept of pain, they have the concept of themselves and so forth, and they can activate those concepts. Um, and, but if self-blindness is possible, then it could be that the creature doesn't believe that they're in intense pain. So take a case in which, for example, you're not in pain so much, but you're in debt. Compare being in debt with being in pain. It seems completely possible that an analogous condition to self-blindness could obtain if you're in debt. You know, if you are in debt and you're rational and you're concerned with whether you're in debt and you're capable of believing that you're in debt, it doesn't even begin to follow that you believe that you're in debt because you may well have not got the relevant information. You might be on the way to your accountant, for example, and your accountant hasn't told you uh, about your bank account. So uh, you could be in debt and be completely rational and be concerned with whether you're in debt and be capable of believing that you're in debt, but you're not, uh, but you don't believe that. But being in pain, and in particularly being in intense pain, doesn't seem to be like that. Uh, it doesn't seem that it's possible um, um, for that to be the case. If you are in intense pain and you're rational and you're capable of believing that you're in intense pain and you're concerned with the question of whether you're in intense pain, it seems impossible that you wouldn't believe in that case uh, that you are in intense pain. So the first premise, so let me go back then, the first, the first premise says, if the broad perceptual model is true, self-blindness is possible. Second premise, but self-blindness is not possible. Ergo, the broad perceptual model is not true. Well, there's no problems with the validity of the argument. The first premise, I think, is true because if you understand perception according to the broad perceptual model, sorry, if you understand, um, uh, uh, yes, if, if, if the broad perceptual model of introspection is operating with a conception of perception according to which seven and eight are in play, but also that one can separate out perception from rationality, then it seems to be true that if the broad perceptual model is true, self-blindness is possible. Because all we need to do is to take a person who's perfectly rational, who is in intense pain, all of these other conditions are met, and yet you subtract the, uh, the relation between the law that obtains between the empirical, the, the, sorry, the law that obtains between their intense pain and the belief that they're in pain. Um, because that empirical law is, after all, empirical, or if you like, it's contingent. There are worlds in which it fails to hold, and if it fails to hold in a certain world, then um, then um, then um, there should be a possibility in which uh, people meet all these conditions. So the first premise here seems to be true. If the broad perceptual model is true, self-blindness is a possible condition. But intuitively, self-blindness is not a possible condition. Um, uh, as I said, P2 seems to be true just because of reflection on this apparent possibility. If you think of ordinary conditions like being in debt, for example, uh, those conditions seems to be true of those conditions that uh, you can be in them, um, you can be completely rational, you can um, ha meet all these psychological conditions, and yet you can fail to believe that you're in debt whereas being in pain doesn't seem to be like that. And if we think that being in pain is a sort of an analogous position for any kind of conscious state, then um, premise two seems to be true. So that means that if that's right, then we have a good argument against the broad perceptual model, um, um, namely this particular argument. As I said, there's no problem about the validity of, uh, of this argument. So that's a way of thinking about the self-blindness argument that's different from the way that you'll find in Burns' discussion and in, to some extent in Shoemaker's discussion. But I think this is, in a way, in a proposal about what is going on underneath uh, in uh, Shoemaker's discussion. 
Okay, so what do you think? Um, that's the end of today's lecture. We'll start again. Uh, well, we may have some discussion about this, but we'll also start again um, uh, in a little bit for next for the for lecture three. Thanks very much.